Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Jim Grant, publisher of Jim Grant's Interest Rate Observer, once said, progress is cumulative in science and engineering, but cyclical in finance. And if there was ever an industry where history repeats itself, finance would certainly be at the top of the list. I'm excited today for the interview and the discussion. I'm inviting back a return guest. His name is Professor Russell Napier. He's the author of the Solid Ground Investment Report for Institutional Investors and co-founder of the investment research portal, Eric, a business he now co-owns with D.C. Thompson. Russell has worked in the investment business for over 30 years and has been advising global institutional investors on asset allocation since 1995. He's written a couple of exceptional books. The first is called The Anatomy of the Bear, Lessons from Wall Street's Four Great Bottoms, and more recently published in 2021, The Asian Financial Crisis from 1995 to 1998, Birth of the Age of Debt. He's the founder and course director for the Practical History of Financial Markets, which is an online course available at the Edinburgh Business School, a course which I've taken and have to say is exceptional, very thorough. Uh, And in 2014, Russell founded the charitable venture, The Library of Mistakes, which is a business and financial history library in Edinburgh, Scotland, that also now has branches in India and Switzerland. And The Library of Mistakes is the subject of my interview with Professor Napier today. So it's my pleasure to welcome back to Upthinking Finance, coming to us from Edinburgh, Scotland, the keeper of the Library of Mistakes, Professor Russell Napier. Russell, welcome back. Emerson, it is great to be back. Thank you. So let's start off with, in your words, what exactly is the Library of Mistakes? Well, the Library of Mistakes is actually, at its core, it's a business and financial history library. But as I like to say, if we called it the Edinburgh Business and Financial History Library, nobody would come. (laughs) So it has a more lurid name. And mistakes, of course, are part of business and financial history. They're not all of it. They're a subset. But they're the subset that we get a lot of focus on. Frankly, if you write a book about a mistake or a calamity, you're likely to sell more copies, maybe even than if you write about a success. So it's just the nature of financial history that that is the case. But I think there's an important point here. I don't know how many books we have in the library of mistakes about Warren Buffett. Now, Warren Buffett is not a mistake. He's a success. There are perhaps hundreds of books about Warren Buffett, but how many of us can be Warren Buffett? It may actually be easier to learn from the mistakes, to learn what not to do, rather than to learn what to do. And uh, I once uh, met a man called Peter Burwash, who was a very successful tennis player. And he said the secret of amateur tennis was to get the ball over the net and uh, allow somebody else to make the mistake. So it is business and financial history, but we end up looking at mistakes because it just may be easier to learn from mistakes and to learn from successes. I mean, how many Steve Jobs are really going to walk into a library and work out that how to be Steve Jobs. So that's why the focus has kind of shifted a little bit on the library mistakes, but it's a broader scope than that. And so, I mean, what was the brain? So I know we talked before and you mentioned, you know, you, you I think referred to yourself as a bit of a historian. I mean, what was sort of the inspiration to even to, to start this? Because it's what, about 10 years now? Is that right? The library's been going for 10 years. There's a course associated with the same charity, which has now been going for just over 20 years. And this is uh, really relates to my own learning experience in financial markets, because I came to financial markets as a lawyer with no background in finance, economics or accounting. Uh, I then sat these exams and started passing the exams that you have to take. uh, But I didn't think that they told me very much about what I was witnessing every day on the uh, on the screen or in investing. Uh, And I found personally that a reading of financial history was the quickest way to get up that learning curve. So I've always personally had an interest. Now, that was started a long time ago, back in 1989. So by 2004, we launched the Practical History of Financial Markets course. Ten years after that, one of the great uh, replies I used to get from when I recommended people to read financial history said, well, where can we find it? Because universities in particular had stripped out a lot of the economics and finance history textbooks. So we then concluded that the next obvious step for the charity was to open a, a library. So it's kind of organic. It's, it's been growing and all the time. The focus is what modern current investors can learn from financial history. Now, was this just your idea or is this something that you had a partner with? I mean, I'm just kind of wondering if this literally you started yeah. it yourself from the ground up. Well, I have to plead guilty to starting this, <laughs> but obviously 
uh, guilty to starting it. But obviously there's been a lot of contributions over the years and financial contributions over the years. So the thing can just grow and grow from a volume perspective. Sure. Uh, but also we've had support from others and provided financial support for it as well, which is you know, why we, uh, why we are. The course also provides uh, revenue. It's, it's sold and it pro- provides revenue to support the, support the library. So my idea, but you know, support comes from everywhere. We now have one in India and Lausanne. And I think I probably shouldn't mention the others that now seem likely because we haven't signed on the dotted line yet. But it looks likely that we'll have two others within the next two years. Uh, I, I, I hate to ask, but uh, it just because you may not be able to say, but is the U.S. on that list anywhere or not yet? Well, the U.S. isn't on on the two. Uh, if I tell you there's someone in the Rocky Mountains who's very keen to open one on his retirement, I think I'd just leave it there. Mm. So uh, it is. I think it's interesting that uh, it would be the Rocky Mountains and not Manhattan that might have the first library of mistakes. I have been to do a pitch to an institution in uh, in Manhattan, uh, and I won't mention its name either. But I was told after a forty five minute pitch that this is Manhattan. We don't do mistakes. Well, <laughs> In, in my opinion, Manhattan is one of the biggest net exporters of mistakes on the planet. But anyway, in the eyes, in the eyes of the Manhattanites, they don't do mistakes. I was just going to say, they're doing their job supplying constant new material. And uh, yeah, no, that's funny. Um, you know, I had a chance uh, for anybody, you know, who's interested, because obviously I haven't got, I hope to get out to Scotland and see that. I mean, the, from what I've seen online, it's beautiful. Um but you can access, I mean, that catalog is amazing that you have set up there. I mean, I, I actually found a book I shared with you offline after our first interview. My, my financial roots go back to the uh, Lincoln Savings, American Continental, Charles Keating uh, Savings mm-hmm. Alone era. And I actually found, you know, I went online and found a really good book I was not aware that was written called Trust Me. And um, it was actually very enlightening. In fact, you know, I could go on and on about that. But um, clearly, you've got uh, just a huge amount of resources. Yeah, the uh, what can I say about our, our, our resources? I mean, they they really go back into the 17th century. Mm. So this has been going on for a long time. I mean, that's we, we kind of start when securities market starts and, and liquidity in securities markets begins in the 17th century. Uh, but I think most of your listeners won't be aware that Scotland, of course, was it, it owes its constitution to one of the greatest mistakes in financial history, which is in the late, about 1696, it decided that it would uh, create its own uh, colony in Darien, which not the one near New York, but the one in the Isthmus of mm. Panama. Uh, I won't go through the details of that, but it basically bankrupted the country and forced it to sue for an alliance with England and forming the United Kingdom. So if you like, our entire country was formed on a mistake. So it's a good place. <laughs> Edinburgh, Edinburgh is quite a good place to have a library of mistakes. That one, that mistake is still debated today. You probably know it's contentious, as is the issue of the union. But, it, but without the mistake, one wonders whether it would have happened or maybe it just would have been delayed by a few decades. Well, I tell you, it's, uh, it's, it's actually exciting, and I'm glad that our firm's been able to have a little bit of a part. You know, that's kind of the fun part about the, uh, the technology world now is, you know, a guy here in, you know, with a small little financial firm here in uh, the southwest part of the U.S. can, can, can you know, get involved with uh, the work you're doing over the other side of the Atlantic. It's fun. Well, you, you know? Your involvement is really appreciated. And anybody listening to this can go to our website, librarymistakes.com, watch live. Uh, maybe the time difference is a bit of a challenge, but these lectures are all recorded. Uh, and there's also a podcast where I do uh, interview people about financial history. So we are creating quite a bit of content, which is all free. And uh, it's all based on this thesis that we can learn something about the future from a better understanding of the past. No, and that's actually a good point. Then I want to jump into the awards ceremony from last week because that was awesome. Um, but there is there is a lot of resources on there, a lot of good information, and your interviews are exceptional. You, you interviewed, I can't remember the gentleman's name, talking about the bond market. You had that uh, portfolio manager that was talking about his mistakes. I mean, it's it's actually a really good point that, you know, yeah, you know, I mean, it's kind of like my theory has always been when the markets are going up, you know, everything's making money, but you really learn about you know, investments and things, what, what happens when, you know, stuff goes sideways. And so it's sort of the same idea. Um, so let's talk about the Mistake of the Year Awards. I, this was great. It's online for anybody. And the link will appear on, on, our, on our during while we're having this conversation. Um, it was an education. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm surprised at the amount of material you had to sift through to decide who the winner was, which I guess is kind of a sad state, a commentary. 
But um, it certainly was a broad array of different, uh, you know, situations, I think. And um, I got to just there's a there's a few what I'm going to call honorable mentions that came up in the beginning. Um, you know, you mentioned wealth managers that remain invested in bonds, which is, a you know, that's a good one. But Ben Bernanke, I, I'm guessing there's some kind of an inside joke there that I'm thinking I should know, but I just couldn't quite connect the dots on that one. It's more of an inside joke to me, actually. And, uh, you know, uh, central bankers are not loved by economists. And I'm not actually an economist myself, but I move in uh, the circles of economists. So when you say give me a nomination for mistake of the year, uh, they all rushed to mention Ben Bernanke. I think, of course, they would be equally scathing about Greenspan. Uh, not quite so bad about uh, the current incumbent. But, uh, yeah, there is a bit of a standing joke. I suspect there's one individual who will nominate Ben Bernanke every year. He may well be watching this, Emerson. He knows who he is. <laughs> so, so okay, is this because Ben Bernanke is the author of The Gift, The Mistake That Keeps On Giving? <laughs> He launched quantitative easing. I think most of us conceded that, that was necessary at the time to prevent the contraction in broad money and liquidity and, and prevent the debt deflation. But the uh, continuation and the continuation and the continuation of it was, uh, you know, that baton was passed onwards. I think uh, most people realize that it's caused huge distortions to asset markets, huge distortions to wealth distribution and ultimately social problems, which may uh, come back to haunt us. So it's really interesting because Bernanke is a financial historian. He's an expert on the great deflation. He acted initially, and in my opinion, rightly to prevent the, what, is, what, what, what turned into a great social rupture in America and the world. But ironically, he may have created a different form of social dislocation through that intervention, which may play out differently. Uh, it would be easy to say it's too early to tell you, but I think we're seeing some of the social political consequences of that. That, that impact on wealth distribution. So, you know, the medicine was definitely better initially than the disease, but the medicine itself comes with consequences. That's something we find out quite a lot when we look at mistakes, mm. that the disease is one thing, but the cure can, you know, it gives you these unintended consequences, which can be just as bad and occasionally even worse. Mm. Okay, well, I'm glad I figured that one out. So you mentioned, and there's just a couple here I wanted to bring up before we get into the final three, but you, uh, this home read, if I'm pronouncing that right, it's, a, it's I guess, a, a, an organization that was set up to help provide uh, housing for the homeless over in Europe. Um, and from what I recall, it sounds like it lasted about two and a half years, and that was the end of it. Um, again, and this is for the education of listeners to see, get, just be able to identify how different things can, can, can blow up. What, what happened there? And, you know, if you can explain that. Well, Home Read is back in the news today. Actually, it's now being investigated by the authorities here. So it's beyond a commercial thing and it's being looked at from a regulatory perspective to look at any any wrongdoing. Uh, it raised in three tranches 760 million sterling. Uh, and it raised it, I think the last tranche was raised as recently as 2022 and it was suspended in 2023. So one of the reasons it focuses is just how incredibly quickly this whole thing happened. In the second half of 2023, it's assets uh, the valuation of his assets were uh, reduced by 58%. Once again, you know, that's not unheard of for these things to happen, but the sheer pace of it uh, was quite dramatic. Now, there are legal suits on this one. So uh, uh, last week, I just read out the, uh, the, uh, the statement of the lawyers who are now working for the shareholders uh, against the advisors to the board and the board. Uh, and it, basically, the allegation is that the board wasn't aware of the condition of the properties, the, the legal... The legal uh, liabilities and the legal duties around the, around these these properties uh, the ability of the tenants to pay rent and that money was you know spent very rapidly and very rapidly fell in value uh, and that's the story of of home read i mean the allegations by the lawyers and i stress it's by the lawyers because i'm not privy to what's been going on specifically inside home read is that the board really didn't understand the business they were in and uh, therefore allocated the capital incredibly badly in a very short period of time about 18 months which uh, had, the, had the share price suspended, and it remains suspended. It was suspended last January, mm. January 2023, and it's still still suspended. So this one will play out in the courts. Uh, but it's a, a, it's a kind of a story of, of how quickly money can be lost if the lawyers are right and the board really didn't know what sort of business it was in and didn't really understand of the risk that the business it was in. You also mentioned something I wanted to ask. You know, if you can elaborate on to the extent you can, because I think it has you talked about European governments backing pensions. 
And I think there's also that I think has an application to a lot of the bigger pensions here in the U.S. I mean, I've got a lot of clients in California that are, in, you know, have CalPERS and even STRS, which is a teacher's pension, and there's a number of big ones like that. Um, just curious, the reason why that got a got a nod. Well, this one in the United Kingdom is different from the one you've mentioned because at least you've got some assets to back yours, okay. which is not, not the situation we find ourselves in in the United Kingdom. So we have 5 million public sector workers uh, here in the UK who will qualify for these pensions. Uh, they are uh, infl inflation protected and they are defined benefit. Now, that's the sort of pension that most people can only dream of, defined benefit inflation link. Uh, and there are some schemes that are funded well enough that can provide that and are currently providing that. Uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, but the main problem with the UK one is it's largely almost totally unfunded. And it will be future taxpayers who make up the payments to these public workers and their large uh, you know, inflation linked defined benefit pension schemes. And no matter how you work that out, we have, as you can probably guess from the nomination, we have someone at Library Mistakes who's who's an actuary who works this out. I mean, his numbers are that that's a 1.4 trillion liability on the government of the United Kingdom, mm. uh, which is, uh, you know, which is going to come due at some course. But because, as you know, the history of mistakes, the history of politics, the history of all decision making is if you can avoid making the difficult decision today, try and push it down the road. So we've history's littered with these where we just pretend it doesn't exist until the day it comes to exist. So it's obviously going to be a problem. Uh, but because nobody's prepared to say when it's a problem and no one's prepared to do anything about it, I suspect it'll be nominated next year and the year after. Uh, and many years to come, we'll realise it's it's it, it's just not sustainable. It can't be funded. Uh, how the government then welches on those uh, obligations, that's a political decision. It's not an economic decision. It's a political decision. But that will have to come in due course. That, that almost, okay, so I'm, I'm giving the wrong comparison. That almost sounds more like Social Security <laughs> here. <laughs> That's really what it is, yeah. uh, the form it takes because of the lack of funding, lack of funding for it. So, you know, we, we could spend a lot of time talking about mistakes and this wealth distribution and the uh, inequalities between the old and the young. Well, this is another one for the young to worry about that, you know, as time goes on, a lot of their tax dollars uh, or tax pounds will be going to pay the pensions of the old people who they so dislike. Yeah. That's going to go. Down, that's going to go down well, isn't it? I mean, the baby, the baby boomers living high off the hog, on the tax paid by the younger generation is uh, something that's really going to be a huge political issue at some stage. Well, kind of ironic. <laughs> um, and then I have to bring this one up only because far fetch. And I laugh because I literally ordered a hoodie that came from Japan <laughs> probably three weeks ago. So that was one I knew. Uh, and I remember, if I remember right, there's some kind of a, at least they began as some kind of a distribution channel for luxury goods or something like that, kind of a hub. Is that right? Um, maybe just share that one. I, I'm, I'm kind of be selfishly asking because it's one I'm actually pretty familiar with, at least from having used them once. Well, the scale of the damage may be worth uh, talking about for investors anyway. I mean, this thing was had a market capitalization at one stage of 26 billion U.S. dollars. At, at the suspended share price, it's worth eight million. Hmm. Now, once again, the lawyers will sort out exactly what's going to go on with the assets of the company and the liabilities of the company, and the creditors are uh, are suing. But Farfetch began life as an e-commerce site, and it sought to match up buyers with luxury branded goods selling companies. Now, the bigger ones of those were not that keen to get involved because obviously they had their own websites, they had their own bricks and mortar, they had their own distribution channels. So it, it kind of struggled with lots of smaller ones. I mean, it was, a, it was a business that had lots of customers and lots of sales. It didn't have lots of profits, of course, as is the way with lots of e-commerce sites. But somewhere along the line, it decided that because of this problem with getting the right type, if you like, of luxury branded products, they would get into the business of buying those companies. So they came to the stock market, raised a lot of capital from memory, about 850 million US dollars, and then went on an acquisition spree. It's a bit like owning a supermarket, not having the right things to sell. So going out and buying, uh, you know, Kellogg's, so that mm. you oh. show you something to sell in your supermarket. So it was a, a, a major diversification. Uh, these are companies that are difficult to value. They were all trading on high valuations anyway. We had a huge boom going on in luxury branded products, partially due to Chinese demand. So, uh, you know, the, the lawyers will tell, history will tell just how overvalued these acquisitions were. Uh, but from setting up to do one business, it was suddenly in another business. 
And the consequence, as I mentioned, is that the market capitalization went from $26 billion to $8 million. Wow. So, so, I mean, the common thread, at least between a couple of these you've mentioned, well, I mean, you could even say the, the pension situation, too, is people in positions not understanding really what they're getting into. I mean, you talk about, you know, buying these businesses, you know, to, to increase your distribution. I mean, what do you know? You know, what is what is an e-commerce site know about running a particular, you know, a clothing company or, a, you know, whatever the luxury item? I mean, that's kind of the, the, the at least a common thread here, right? Yeah, well, you find standard themes and mistakes. I mean, uh, we could uh, classify them. No doubt as the awards go on year to year to year, we'll begin to classify these into categories. Uh, and that one is diversification, or I think it's Warren Buffett who calls it diverse diversification. And uh, that will crop up over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, look, we, we mentioned Farfetch, but it's you know, it's very, very common for boards to get into that. I mean, we, we can sit and run off a whole ream of boards mm. that have got into that. I mean, they feel compelled to do it because the original business is struggling, usually. They convince themselves then that there's a synergy between the two which is usually not there, but you can convince yourself of anything if you need something to, to perk up your share price. And then the rest is history. I mean, we just ply on and it happens again and again and again. Mm. Uh, it's, it really should be up to the board to rein in chief executives on that. I think that would be my opinion anyway. Uh, but often the board get caught up in the hysteria because who doesn't want to be involved in a company that is growing, doing acquisitions and getting onto the front page of the newspapers? So I think the board sometimes gets caught up in the, the, the hysteria. And of course, they've got lots of investment bankers, Emerson, telling them that it's a wonderful idea. We mustn't forget that as well. Yeah, I'm sure. The fees for that kind of work, I imagine, are pretty good too. Um, there's a lot of wisdom what you just said. That's... that's uh... Got, yeah, I can see we could go on for hours talking about this stuff, which is like I could get why you had to start a whole library <laughs> to try to contain it all. So, okay, so then you guys got to the top three, and 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 Credit Suisse was number three, uh, uh, you know, number three in the in the the sweepstakes here. And um, the main thing I had that I just wrote a couple notes down. I wanted to bring up, you know, it's the, I mean, the bank itself had, or the firm itself had been around for you know cl- pushing. Well, I won't say two hundred years, but you know. 1856, um, survived the great financial crisis, which you'd think that would be, you know, enough. But, um, you know, what happened there? Because for me, again, and, and you live this, I, that kind of came out of left field, but that doesn't mean that you, you had also mentioned, I think, at the ceremony that the seeds had been kind of brewing for a while, if I'm remembering that right. Yeah, when we look back in the last 30, 40 years of history, we, we will see and we've already seen that there are lots of banks and bankers who were just not contented in being a local bank. Let's call it a, a retail bank, maybe even a retail bank with a with a corporate arm. The, 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 the basic dynamic was get big or get eaten. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from Scotland, uh, the home of Royal Bank of Scotland and Bank of Scotland, that I think they were very clearly in the category where they wanted to get big enough so that they couldn't be taken over. So it wasn't a uniquely Swiss affliction, this desire to grow. Uh, but the Swiss did want to play with the very biggest of boys in the room. Uh, back in the 1980s, they acquired First Boston, which is a prime, you know, a very good uh, U.S. broker. So they were instantly putting money on the line to play in the most competitive market of all, which is the U.S. capital market. Uh, but they followed that up with a stream of acquisitions of service companies. And with the benefit of hindsight, they probably overpaid for all of them. Uh, but I think, I mean, the lesson I flagged up at the award ceremony is paying very high valuations for service companies where all of the assets go up and down in the lift. Basically, all of the assets go up and down in the lift. They are the individuals. I mean, even Warren Buffett, when he was briefly involved with Salomon Brothers, really struggled to uh, to make money in a business where the uh, where, where the assets behave like football players rather than uh, rather than employees. Mm. So we had acquisition after acquisition after acquisition. Uh, in the last uh, several years, that began to catch up with the bank. It, it eventually led to a an outflow of funds. Interestingly, for Credit Suisse, there were two sources of funds there. I mean, obviously, it has depositors like any other bank, but it had a really big wealth management business as well. And quite a lot of the value in the shares was associated with the, the size of the assets under management from the wealth management business. But those funds began to leave as well. Uh, the departure of those funds doesn't in any way threaten the uh, the solvency of a of a major bank, unlike the departure of deposits. But it did threaten the uh, the valuation of the bank. 
Uh, and so uh, we had a, a capital infusion by one of its major shareholders from Saudi Arabia. But what really finished it off was that uh, sh same shareholder saying just a few weeks later that there would be no more capital uh, and the runs uh, in both sides of that business got bigger and bigger. It's a thing that had been seen coming for many, many years. I, I'm not sure anybody could have forecast which year it was going to happen in, but it just seemed more likely as the, as the years went by. Uh, as I flagged up in the awards ceremony, one of the key things about this was the scale of the intervention that had to be put in place to make sure this bank moved smoothly into new ownership, and new ownership in this case is, is UBS. Uh, the package wasn't ultimately all used, but if you put together the package from the government, the package from the central bank, uh, I think it was over a third of Swiss GDP mm. was put up as a potential size of intervention that was needed. This is the second biggest bank in Switzerland. You know, your uh, Silicon Valley bank, which we will come back to, uh, was the 16th biggest bank in America. These guys lost their second biggest bank uh, really in a weekend. Uh, after a long, long period when everybody wondered, you know, could it survive? Suddenly it disappeared in a in a weekend, which is maybe another part of the story, is just how quickly things can get moving when confidence is lost. It's always been a problem for bankers, but things have speeded up a little bit in terms of uh, the loss of confidence. And that's that's Credit Suisse, and that's why we put it in there. I think it's because, and this is a remarkable thing, uh, there were so many mistakes last year that it's almost like we didn't notice that one of the biggest banks in the world just disappeared. That, so you just brought up an interesting point uh, that... It, and I'm, tell me if I'm getting this right. It sounds like some of these decisions that were made, you know, 30 to 40 years ago. I mean, that's like a slow, long, but I mean, that's just, I mean, how do you even anticipate that? You know, because then my thought goes to Russell, it goes to, okay, you know, we know like the AIGs, we know all the bailouts that happened here, you know, in 08, 09. But are there still lingering consequences from that that are, are building and ready to, you know, bubble up at some point here in the next, you know, four or five years? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It just it seems like, well, that's really hard to predict. I mean, how does how do any how does anybody even really you know, you mentioned hindsight and valuations of some of the acquisitions. I mean, how do you see that in real time? Is there a way to even identify it? Well, I think the first thing is it, it, banks are different. So banks have to be geared. It's the nature of the business to borrow short and lend long. They take our deposits and they lend long. And if you run any business with gearing, you're more susceptible to the consequences from a mistake. Uh, and those mistakes can, can cost you your, your solvency. So the that's the first thing to say. Uh, these things are more important for banks than they are for the, for, for the rest of us. Uh, naming the timing for Credit Suisse, I don't think it could have been done. I mean, I, I know many people who've been pointing it out for years, but... I cannot mention their names. There are other major European banks where people have been saying for years that mm. they could follow the path that Credit Suisse has just followed, that they've got into the international markets. They've overpaid for assets. They haven't succeeded in those businesses. And uh, I, I just don't think it was possible to know when it was going to happen. You know, the thing that finished it off was a couple of announcements. They they announced that their reporting accounts w had material weaknesses. Never a good sign when you announce material weaknesses to your reporting accounts. And and if you're public, if you one of your shareholders jumps up in public and says we're not providing any more support, this is not a wise thing for any shareholder to do. I think. So I, I do think it was very difficult. But yes. There are lingering problems from the GFC and before in that a lot of the assets, I mean, if you look at the uh, price to book ratio of European banks, for instance, they're trading at deep, deep discounts to their assets. Well, many of those banks also did acquisitions of other businesses prior to the GFC at, at you know, great premiums to, uh, to, to book value. So that is that there's a lingering problem for many of these banks. And as I said, only modesty and the lawyers prevent me from mentioning who they are. <laughs> Well, no, that's that's helpful um, and a little concerning, but you know, such is the world we live in. Um, the next one was this FTX, and I, I mentioned before we started, I, I'm still not clear on exactly what happened here. The, the thing I, one of the things I remember that came up when when you brought them up at the the uh, the ceremony, I'm calling it, was that the 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 CEO was raising money while he was playing video games, which just inherently sounds like a problem. Um, but maybe if you know to the extent you can again, I I think it'd be really helpful to to bring that down a few notches so people really get it. I mean everybody's familiar. You know we saw pictures of uh, the CEO and that 
young 20 year old i mean that, that his treasure or, or cfo or whatever i mean you know think these these two are in charge of all this money it's so that you know that's a whole nother topic i shouldn't probably even go there but anyway ftx well that is that's the thing we have to flag up because ftx raised two billion us dollars from investors and they raised it from the smartest guys in the room or people we like to think are the smartest guys in the room which are kind of venture capital private equity and the problem was that there was then no control over that investment, which is absolutely stunning when you think of it, given the age. I mean, young people can be very smart, very innovative, very creative. Mark Zuckerberg was very young when he created a, you know, what turned out to be a huge company. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And there may be nothing wrong in taking the sort of risks that the venture capitalists took. But to have nobody on the board, to have no internal control, to rely upon the uh, Let's call them the geniuses. Maybe they were geniuses. The geniuses in the company with no control seems just to be incredible. Everybody who invested in the company was getting fees. They were getting paid for their expertise at this. Uh, but it's something that's come up again and again, particularly with a company called Wirecard and Greensill. You know, major investments from major VCs, major private equity investments, and yet the level of oversight, which was really pretty terrible. So without that oversight, something was probably going to happen uh, and something did happen and it was confusing two different businesses really it was the ceo who was funding one business with money that people were treating really as a form of deposit in one business that's arguably whether you know crypto is a is a form of deposit but arguably taking a form of deposit and using it to fund a, a different business without the knowledge of people who were putting money into the deposit taking risks with the depo with the so-called deposit that people didn't fully understand. That's not a that's not a new problem at all. I mean, all over the world, lawyers are often found dipping their fingers into the client account, for instance, and end up in, in court themselves. Uh, Better Call Saul might be a pretty good example of that for those who, uh, who watch it. You know, this is not a new problem that funds over here are misused over here. That, that The issue was that why on earth did these investors not have some form of control to monitor this, control this? and ultimately prevent it. So that's why they were nominated for the mistake. That's the first reason they were nominated for the mistake. But the truth is, though, in FTX, there's a myriad of mistakes that we could focus on. Of course, uh, FTX did get a criminal conviction. I think he's on appeal, but he has at this stage, uh, uh, or, sorry, uh, Sam bankman fried I should say, has a criminal conviction, and uh, which is on appeal, I think. You explained, too, as I remember, that there was an element of sort of a... I don't know what the word is, I, uh, some kind of a, a code of, you know, some kind of warped. Well, I remember you guys talked about CEOs being four times as likely to be a psychopath. <laughs> there was a study that was, which, you know, again, we could go off on tangents here with this stuff. But there was some kind of code of, you know, a, a willingness to, by the CEO to just take whatever risks, you know, yeah. for some kind of his perception of the greater good. And if the whole thing blew up, then, you know, no harm, no foul. I mean, am I? Yeah, well, I think the best way to put that is the testimony of Caroline Ellison, who was his one-time girlfriend and, and also involved in the company. And she said on their oath that if Bankman Fried could toss a coin, and the consequence of tossing the coin is that everybody in the world would die if you got a head. But if you got a tail, everybody in the world would be twice as well off. He would flip the coin. Now, most of us wouldn't flip the coin, <laughs> but he would flip the coin. Now, he, and I think it's not fair to call it purely utilitarianism, but that is a, 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 what he, he thought this was utilitarianism, which is a form of uh, philosophical argument that goes back to John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham in the middle of the, of the 19th century. Uh, but he argued that this was correct. And I think we see a lot of that in business. Uh, I think Theranos may be another good example. Uh, he also said that it, she also testified that he didn't really care whether he told the truth or not, because the only thing that really mattered was the uh, uh, the, the, the greater good for, for everyone, at least as he conceived it and on the risks that he imposed upon them. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I think that is something that pervades the corporate world. Now, the corporation is a very powerful part of our society, very important part of our society and does an awful lot of good in society as well and regenerates the products that we all choose to buy from it. Uh, but there is also within it a uh, perhaps a form of decision-making, which is maybe not very uh, 
uh, it's very hard to reconcile with the morals of the society as a whole. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying, by no means am I saying that everybody who runs a corporation is like Sam Bankman Fried. <laughs> Just saying that there are some people within it. And the test that you mentioned, or the survey that you mentioned, is from a book called The Psychopath Test by John Ronson, where he thinks he proves that psychopaths are four times more likely to run listed companies. Well, that's a problem for all of us, for society. If we have created a incentive structure that over rewards psychopaths, I think we need to reconsider the uh, incentive structure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good place to start. Um, you know, I was thinking about this because I, I, the first thing you said about the smartest guys in the room giving people like this all this money, and, and, and it's almost like I, there used to be a term, I don't know if it's still relevant, called blind pool. I remember some of these big firms, you know, you just – They'd have this, basically, you give them their money and you wouldn't know what it was going to do or where it was going to go. And, and that was, you know, but it kind of reminds me, in, you know, you know, because you have the, the, the tenure in this industry and this work. But, you know, it's like 98, 99. It, it, that kind of strikes me as that same just throw any money at anything that has a dot com after it. I mean, it just there's a sloppiness. I, I wouldn't even call it greed that just, it, it you know, it's, again, it gets this like you know, the history repeating itself in some certain different kind of ways. But that just strikes me as sort of along the same ilk. Yeah. So there's two different issues. You can sort of spray the money around as, uh, you know, take a basket and hope that, you know, the, the thing is that one of these things can, can shoot the lights out by such a huge number yeah. that it can compensate for five or six duds. Mm. Uh, but that's not the reason that we had uh, FTX nominated. It was that if you are going to give somebody money, at least have the you know the the good grace if you're calling if you're if you are claiming a fee for doing this, to put some monitoring in place. Yeah. So uh, I'm not particularly a, a a kind of a fan of let's just spray the money around and see if we get one winner. Uh, but if I was in that business, I would at least have somebody on the board. So that is that is the mistake I think. You know, venture capitalists they're gonna they're gonna find a lot of duds. Of course they're gonna find a lot of duds. But that wasn't the problem with FTX. The problem was that. They gave two billion U.S. dollars and didn't have any oversight really on how it was using. There was an advisory board, but the advisory board didn't have any real control uh, over what was going on in the on the company. So it's a it's a different. This is not a criticism of venture capital. It's just a criticism of this particular approach to it, yeah. where you have no oversight or no control once the money is handed over. No, that's no, that's good. All right, I'll I'll, I'll you already mentioned the name, but I'll let you. Uh, Announce the the winner for anybody who hasn't seen the uh, the event yet, and let's talk a little bit about them. Well, it is your own. Uh, have we got outside? Yeah, we. I think we're mainly on American corporations so far. Farfetch, I think, was technically Portuguese, though maybe listed in America or listed in the UK. Uh, but yes, it is your very own Silicon Valley Bank, the sixteenth largest bank in the United States of America. Now we have it nominated because we think it found a new way to bankrupt the bank which is quite an achievement given that banks have been around since the 17th century and they're failing all the time. I mean, they're literally failing all the time. You have a lot of banks in America. If you look at the FDI statistics, it's very rare to find a quarter where you don't have a bank failing. You know, sometimes they just get wound up. They don't fail and cost anybody any money. But they, they find a new way to do this. Uh, and that is they find the best credit in the world or what is certainly one of the best credits in the world. It's called the United States government. And they managed to go, managed to, I have to choose the word bankrupt carefully because they're not bankrupt. They ended up in the arms of a, of a rescuer. But they managed to uh, find themselves needing rescued, is probably the best way of putting it, by, by lending money to the best credit in the world, which is the United States government, one of the best credits in the world. So that's quite an achievement. And for a banker, I'm not sure that that's happened before. I think there's been some investors who may have got themselves wrong way around in that before. I'm thinking of Orange County and Robert Citron, perhaps back in the early 1990s. Yeah. Uh, but that was a you know a, a pension fund. That was an, that was what was supposed to be an ungeared institution. Uh, but these guys managed to do it owning owning government bonds. So that, so that's the first thing. You know, you can hedge all that. First of all, you don't have to take that risk at all. You could be at the short end of the government bond and not take huge capital risk. But they seem to be at the long end of the curve and take that risk and not hedge it in, in any way. By Christmas of 2022, I think the loss on, on government bonds was 15 billion US dollars, which was enough to frighten the horses, as we say here in the UK, which is the second mistake, which maybe we should come back to. But they had a lot of very large horses owning deposits there. It wasn't the depositors of Silicon Valley Bank were not uh, mom and pops. They were not widely spread. They were not guaranteed. 85% of their deposit base wasn't guaranteed. 
because the size of the deposits was so big. So it didn't take a lot to get that stampede underway. So they had two mistakes at the same time. Okay. So to explain for anybody who doesn't understand, it, their portfolio was primarily just, what, long-term government bonds? They, no, they, they had a very big balance sheet, but they had a significant portion in government debt. It turns out quite a lot of that was further out the yield curve. Okay. The problem with that is where the further out you go the yield curve, the more risk to capital you have. So you usually, you usually get rewarded with a higher yield if you go out there. It's quite you know, tempting if you take deposits at a low rate to get out that yield curve and make a profit. But you are taking a capital risk. If I lend you money, Emerson, I'm also taking a capital risk, obviously, because you may not pay me back. But as interest rates go up, it'll take us some time to establish whether you're not going to pay me back or not. But the, this, these bonds of the American government, they, re, they reset minute to minute. And the losses associated with that can come through very, very, very quickly. And that's what happened in this particular scenario. Worth pointing out that in the summer of 2020, we could say with a high degree of confidence that the yield on, on government bonds generally was at a 5,000 year low. Mm. We have interest rates going back to the Sumerian period, which is 3000 BC. So to take a bet that interest rates at a 5,000 year low will go lower was also something that was quite brave. But as you mentioned in the introduction, lots of wealth managers also took a similar, uh, a similar view that a 5,000 year low for interest rates could actually be continue to go even even lower mm. so there's just all these things combined but it's certainly as i said in the in the summary of the ceremony there were lots of mistakes but the biggest one was not to read any financial history to realize that bonds have yields and prices and the interest rates go up and down and when you're at a five thousand year low there is a relatively good prospect that the next move is going to be up <laughs> well well put so here is the thing that I learned from that, that because I remember, you know, and as you know, trying to get information without really digging into to the weeds is a little difficult. So you get these things about, you know, it was a social media run, you know, that somehow the word spread and everybody started pulling money out. In fact, my wife even sent me a, a tweet from somebody, some guy who had money there who was talking about how literally, you know, he couldn't get his money out and. And um, but then I realized, in, and I want to just confirm this is the right understanding of this. It was a lot. It wasn't some. It wasn't like your typical retail base that's going to go into some big bank and you know go cash their check and you know whatever. You had a, a concentration amongst a lot of the same type of people with a lot of uninsured money in a in a in a kind of located in a, in a general demographic you know or geographic area who all started communicating together i mean it's literally a small powerful group of people with a lot of money that created this panic which i mean that's that to me i mean is that the right understanding yeah that's exactly right i, I can't say to you that we've never had a bank like this before but we certainly haven't had many banks like this before where such a high proportion of deposits are uninsured and it's a uh, mm. an elite group who all know each other and communicate with each other. Remember, remember also that that elite group is paid to get good investment returns. If I was one of them, the most embarrassing thing that could possibly happen to me is that I could lose money on deposits. Mm. I mean, there'd be nothing more detrimental to the future of my career that you know this guy couldn't even invest in a bank deposit and make money. So uh, you could see why, when the time came, nobody, you know, nobody wanted. To, it's like uh, pass the parcel. <laughs> you know, it's the end. Of, it's the end of your career if you happen to be stuck in that in that bank in the deposits of that bank as mm. the FDIC has to suspend or close it. So it was a uh, I mean, the word unique is overused. I think it probably was unique in terms of the concentration, a lack of insurance, and we have to stress that. You know, had everybody been insured, I'm not sure. I'm, if, I mean, SVB may still be with us. Mm. Had all their deposits been insured, that that was a quite a large loss. But the loss in itself may not have uh, finished off the bank if its uh, depositors had hung around. The uh, you know people focus on the ease of communication as a reason why that happened, and that's obviously true. We can all communicate more easily. We all have apps where we can press a button and, and move the money. But I think more important was the lack of insurance and this uh, this uh, this very narrow, confined, 16 biggest bank in America, but still a very limited number uh, of depositors who all kind of knew each other. Last thing on this, and then I'll kind of get to the, the final conclusion. Um, you, uh, what, was, what was the significance, and this is really just for people that, again, hear this stuff but don't really understand, because you, you mentioned the day-to-day -day valuation 
Um, where does the, you know, the value of those bonds that they own going down? I mean, what's the, can you explain that component of it? You know, people, deposits going and the bank being forced to sell. Maybe elaborate on yes. that a little bit. Yeah, so people should just think of a, of a bank's balance sheet, maybe the way they think of their own. You have assets and you have liabilities. For most of us, that would be our mortgage and that would be our home. When you find yourself in a situation where your, uh, your liabilities are worth more than your assets, then we say it's negative equity. Now, the problem for a, any listed institution, but particularly a bank, is that that is all declared to the stock market on a quarterly basis. And if your asset price is falling pretty dramatically and the equity, that gap, I call it the fine sliver of hope between assets and liabilities. Uh, if the value of your assets is falling and the value of your liabilities, primarily deposits, isn't, then people are going to look and say, this guy's capital is shrinking rapidly and maybe one day won't have any capital. Mm. Uh, and, a bank, and a bank without capital is a bank where there is a risk that your deposits could be frozen or if you're not insured, you could actually lose deposits. So the problem for FDIC is that everybody could see really every day how much money they were losing on government bonds. In the government bond portfolio would be disclosed every quarter. And then all the analysts could look at the price of government bonds and they could see quite quickly that, that perhaps this gap, this, this gap between assets and liabilities, this equity was declining and declining. Uh, and then unlike your mortgage, which you have locked in for 30 years, the depositors can pull the money overnight. The colleagues can pull the money instantly. So that's the difference between your own personal situation and the situation uh, for a bank today. Most people, I think particularly in the US, have the 30-year mortgage, but the banks are borrowing overnight. And if you lose the confidence of the people who lend money to you overnight, there's very little that's going to save you in a, in a situation like that, which is why the deposit insurance is so important. Uh, and why it's changed the nature of banking since it was first introduced in the Great Depression. It was introduced in the Great Depression to try and stop this damaging situation. But as I said, the problem with Silicon Valley Bank is they managed to source their deposits almost exclusively from people who didn't get the benefit of that insurance. Mm. I actually remember I was working as a manager at a savings alone in you know late 80s, early 90s when that whole industry collapsed. And we had this thing called the Resolution Trust Corporation, because the FSLIC, which was the FDIC of the savings loan industry, had gone bankrupt. Um, but they came out, and I remember they, they, we were trained at the time on how to insure a family of four. You know, this was back when I think the limit was like 100000 per account. But you could structure the accounts to, to insure like $1.4 million, something, you know, it was, it, just by, you know, trust, joint, this, you know, the whole thing, and you could do all these different things. And yeah, so to think that um, you know it, it isn't hard, you know, to 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 extend that that insurance out depending upon how these accounts are set up. So to think that people weren't covered in those kind of amounts is you know it's a little absurd. Well, so. as a family, you can probably do it. But remember, these are venture capitalists. Right. They receive tens of millions, and we're going to say even billions in cash, yeah. and they, inv they they can receive it up front and invest it very slowly. So now maybe they should have been in treasury bills, which would have been a lot safer. And they, they, they were found themselves with lots of cash. Yeah. It's worth saying, of course, as well, that the whole point of this was to invest the money. So naturally, if you were running a big bank like that, you might have expected your deposits to go down as it was invested. So that's why it was different. And most bankers wouldn't accept that concentration risk. They'd try to have the, the branch network. They'd try to have the mom and pops. They'd try to have the insured deposits. And then all bankers have something on top of that, usually corporations, uh, venture capitalists, but these guys were heavily concentrated on the one source of one source of funding. So that that exercise which you mentioned, yeah, you can do that with maybe a million dollars, maybe a wee bit more than a million dollars. But these guys had yeah, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to put out there into into banks, and they all decided to go to the same bank. Mm. You also mentioned something too, and then I'll I want to get to the final question here, but um, that which I hadn't heard that it was the second largest failure. Uh, bank failure in the U.S. to Washington Mutual during the great financial crisis. So um, anyway, significant. So here's the thing. I remember at the end, you, you, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm asking for something that isn't, uh, isn't uh, really a, a question that can be answered. But you talked about, you know, the lessons learned, you know, I'm asking the lessons learned from all this and maybe even extends into this whole uh, endeavor with the library and all the research that you've done, um, both as an analyst and, in, you know, building out this, this library, but you know, the horseshoe nail, 
You know, if you had to hang, you know, if there's one lesson, I mean, that just comes to mind, I know there's a bunch. I mean, we've talked a whole lot of things, but is there one thing that just seems to just continually repeat itself to you as you, you know? I think the core of all of this, and I'll quote from the the late, great Charlie Munger, is uh, never, ever think about anything when you should be thinking about incentives. And most of these failures happen because the person allocating the capital effectively had an incentive to to do it the way they did it. Now, I think one of the benefits of us reading and studying and understanding financial history is that we may be able to create better incentives. Uh, And I'm not talking about the government. I'm not talking about regulation. I'm talking about boards having better incentives. So there, as you say, there are a myriad of these things, but ultimately most of them come down to the fact that people do stupid things because they're incentivized to do stupid things and they're paid to do stupid things. And a lot of that is about the time horizon. Mm. You know, if you and I are, are really playing towards the annual bonus, we can hope to get away with things up until Christmas because we'll get that bonus and it may not be clawed back after Christmas. So when, we, when people do ask me, you know, what's the one thing we could do to try and make this better? It is changing the incentive structure. And, you know, I could we could run through lots of different ways you could do that, but at least extend the time horizon for the incentive structure. Don't reward people on a 12-month basis because you're, you're paying them really uh, you know, to, to, to take very high risks over the short term. And over the long term, they can't do that because they're much more likely to get caught out. But uh, the, most people in these, I mean, all these mistakes were made with people using other people's money. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of them had their own equity in this, but on the, fundamentally it was other people's money. To have the wrong incentive structure in place for people managing other people's money, whether in an operating company or an investment company, uh, is is the mistake. And over the years now, we've put in place these wrong incentives and we need to change them. Mm. No, and I, you know, like you said, that could go on. That we could spend another hour talking about that because you mentioned a number of these things in that in your book, the Asian financial crisis. I remember benchmarking and this. You know, there's the system itself. I mean, again, that's a whole other subject. It's it's structured in a way to create these kinds of conflicts of interest. I, think. I always think, you know, because I live in Edinburgh and Adam Smith used to live here, the famous Adam Smith, the father of economics. And if I sat him down, if he was sitting beside me in this desk and I explained to him the way we run this thing that we call capitalism and the incentive structures we have in it, he wouldn't recognize it at all. Mm. It's just not the thing that he thought capitalism was because of the bad incentive structures and the targets and the indexing. I mean, indexing, what on earth is indexing where the company with the biggest market capitalization receives a higher cost of cap or a lower cost of capital and more capital at a lower cost when it demands it? I mean, that's not what Adam Smith wrote about uh, in The Wealth of Nations. So that's the problem. Uh, we, we call it one thing, but it's become distorted over the years. Uh, frankly, I think it's become gamed over the years by managerial capitalism, which is another big story we could go into. It's run for the benefit of the agents and not the principals, another story we could go into. Uh, so you can get up, I think, and you can be very critical of the system without saying I'm very critical of capitalism. You, what you're actually saying is this isn't capitalism. Capitalism without competition is what? I don't know what it is, but increasingly uh, in many industries as well, we've actually got no competition. Smith, Smith is very, very against that. So there's so many things wrong with it that I think could make it better. And uh, as long as there are things wrong with it, we'll be having an annual Library of Mistakes Award ceremony, I think. And uh, I don't, I've don't. i no great hope that we st- that I stand up one year under a big banner saying, Mission Accomplished. Yeah. I think we'll be there for some time to come. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Um, Russell, listen, I want you to know, I, I know you, you know, you're, you're a busy person and, and I, I just appreciate you making time. And I got to tell you, um, you know, we're a small little firm. We manage $200 million. We, we have a, a, a nice manageable uh, group of clients we work with that are good people. And, um, I think <clears throat> what gives us an advantage is the fact that I've, I've got resources like you, you know, certainly the library database, but particularly our, the solid ground newsletters, the quarterly report, these phone calls. I mean, it just... It's it's refreshing to get information that's coming from a completely different place that somewhere along the line or another, you know, isn't connected to a product that's actually connected to, you know, a historical view. And there's really value in that for us. And so I know I've told you that before to email you from time to time, but I just want you to know I appreciate it. And um, it makes us I feel like I said, you know, we have a bit of a competitive advantage in that regard. Um, 
And well, uh, what, I, what I hopefully I can say to you is that what financial history helps us do is to ask the right questions. Yeah. This may not seem like a big issue, but in my opinion, most of Wall Street is getting all the right answers to all the wrong questions. Mm. So just asking the right questions is a good thing. And then you don't even have to get the right answer. You just have to get a slightly better answer than everybody else. So I don't think this is rocket science. This science. I'm not qualified to be at rocket science. I'm not that smart. But I can at least look back at the past to try and work out what the right questions are. And I think if we keep our focus on the right questions... We've got a reasonable chance of getting slightly better answers and better outcomes for all our clients. No, oh, that's perfect. Well, I always like to end on a rising note of hope. So I'll say thank you so much for your time thank today, you. Russell. And it's good to see you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.